Today I'm here to help raise awareness about a medical condition called dysautonomia and to explain how and why it has completely changed my life. It all started with the Rotary Youth Exchange Conference in March of 2012. When I walked into the hotel, I was immediately told to not perform CPR on Destiny. My first thought was, who's Destiny? My second thought was, why shouldn't I do CPR? This conference was the one where rebound students became Rotex students. And right away, I ended up agreeing to head up a project, which we would call Project Destiny, in honor of her. This girl I was raising money for quickly turned into my friend who was really sick, and eventually became a very, very close friend of mine. One who shows me just how strong a person can really be when they just as easily could have given up. As we learned more and more about Destiny's medical conditions, we realized that the most important thing we could do was to raise awareness, and that is what led me here today. Destiny has helped me create this presentation and has asked me to share her story. She wants us to spread the word about this difficult condition so that more people can understand it, and hopefully someday the medical community will know more about it. In this picture, Destiny was very sick, but still trying to be a part of Rotary. The picture was taken at the District Governor's Conference in 2012. It was actually a really bad day for Destiny, but she only looked sick to those of us who knew how bad she was really feeling. As I will explain later, dysautonomia usually strikes during adolescence, which is what happened with Destiny. While her problem started around the age of 14, she wasn't diagnosed until the age of 18. Well, <laughs> Before Destiny was sick, she was just like any other student. She even went on a year-long rotary exchange to Germany. But by the time she was finally diagnosed, her problems had gone from simply fainting to horrible seizures, uncontrollable blood pressure, and even organ failure. These are some of the conditions she suffers from, and many of these are symptoms of dysautonomia. I will talk about some of them later as they relate to dysautonomia, but I will keep my focus mainly on dysautonomia itself. Here you can see some pictures from before Destiny was sick. These were her senior pictures. And these are pictures from when she was in Germany on her Rotary Youth Exchange. She went in 2009, 2010, and still says it was the best year of her life. So what is dysautonomia? Dysautonomia <coughs> simply means a malfunction of the autonomic nervous system. There are many causes of dysautonomia, and it can have a huge variety of symptoms. An easier way to think of this is that dysautonomia is the umbrella term for many symptoms, the way candy is the general name for Skittles, chocolate, Snickers, or any other candy. The autonomic nervous system is the quiet or unconscious functions of the body, such as your heart rate, blood pressure, and digestion. This means that when you have dysautonomia, the things your body is supposed to do without you thinking about it don't work the way they're supposed to. Some of the systems that are most greatly affected are the gastrointestinal system, the endocrine system, and the circulatory system. This is a diagram of the autonomic nervous system, which has two parts the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. Dysautonomia can affect just the parasympathetic, just the sympathetic, or both nervous systems. The parasympathetic nervous system has a more relaxed function, while the sympathetic nervous system is more active. You can see this in the picture where one dilates while one constricts, and one inhibits while one stimulates. Destiny's sympathetic nervous system is impacted, and we know this because many of the examples shown in this picture also affect destiny. Her pupils are almost always fully dilated, and at first, Dr. said this was because she was taking drugs, not because she was sick. Destiny also suffers from chronic asthma and a very fast heart rate, which are probably from this. The issues with her stomach are also most likely from problems in her sympathetic nervous system, and she goes days without <coughs> sleeping sometimes, because there are times when her adrenal glands are producing so much excess adrenaline that she can't fall asleep. Your gastrointestinal tract is a tube which runs through your body and ultimately digests the food you eat. <clears throat> Problems with this can lead to trouble swallowing food and drinks, and even trouble digesting the food you eat. If this becomes severe enough, you may be diagnosed with something called gastroparesis, which is paralysis of the stomach muscles. Gastroparesis can be its own problem, or it can be associated with dysautonomia, like it is with destiny. It's something awful to have as well as to see. Because Destiny does not have a feeding tube, any food she eats continues to sit in her stomach, which causes extreme pain as well as many other problems. People who have this often don't feel like eating because they already feel full. When they do eat, it usually comes right back up. 
so was frequently misdiagnosed as anorexia and bulimia. Destiny has always loved to eat just as much as any other teenager, but in March she started having these symptoms a lot more frequently. And in the picture you can see a normal stomach which is empty and a weakened stomach which remains full. Some symptoms of this are very dramatic and unhealthy weight loss, which leads to a lot of malnourishment. You can see in the picture Destiny has lost a lot of weight. There's also a lot of nausea, pain, and vomiting. The endocrine system is made up of many glands that regulate almost every cell and organ in the body by the release of hormones. These are some of the major ones in the picture, and in the middle you can see the adrenal gland, which is one that causes destiny a lot of problems. Problems with your endocrine system can lead to an uncontrolled fight or flight response, an insufficient absorption of nutrients, and a change in your growth and development. Symptoms of this include insomnia, change in your metabolism, and even organ failure. Ever since I met Destiny, I knew she had insomnia, and we can be a really funny combination because I have a form of narcolepsy. It took a lot for me to change my sleeping pattern to even be able to stay up and talk with her at night, but it did happen eventually. But insomnia is also a trigger for Destiny's seizures, and this is the outcome of one that she had in the hospital. Her kidneys and liver are also failing due to problems with her endocrine system, and some days it is much more visible than others. In the picture, you can see that her eyes are very red-rimmed, which happens on days that her liver isn't doing very well. Your circulatory system is what delivers blood throughout the body. In the picture here, you can see how it covers the entire body, and red is oxygen-rich blood, <coughs> and blue is oxygen depleted. Problems with the circulatory system can have very dramatic effects on a person's health. These usually include orthostatic intolerance, which is when the body doesn't respond to position changes appropriately, so the person often faints, and excessive fatigue from things as simple as taking a shower or folding laundry. Some symptoms of this are very high and very low blood pressure, a very fast and very slow heart rate, arrhythmias, palpitations, and fainting. This is obviously very hard to treat because they all contradict each other. I've seen Destiny's blood pressure sit at 160 over 110 and then drop to 40 over 20. And when it goes that low, she doesn't wake up. I've also watched her heart rest in the 180s and then go so slow I can't find a pulse. You remember when I said I couldn't do CPR? We couldn't do this because when Destiny faints, it's usually very hard to find her pulse. And laying her down is the best way to allow her circulatory system to come back into its normal state. CPR carries the very high risk of breaking bones, which could puncture her lungs and her heart. Also, at this point, Destiny already had broken bones, which were in the healing process from receiving CPR in the hospital in February. <coughs> this is a picture that shows how dangerous fainting can be. Here, Destiny had fainted into a stair railing and caused a lot of damage to her mouth. And this is the wheelchair that was donated by the Clintonville Rotary Club. It was, and still is, so <coughs> important to keep her safe because it keeps her from standing too long and fainting. Here she was using it at the district governor's conference. Dysautonomia can be localized or generalized, which means it can affect just one part of a person's body or it can cause their entire autonomic system to fail. It can also be the primary condition or it can be associated with something else, such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Parkinson's disease. While there is no one specific cause, some of the more common ones have been found to be a trauma, usually a surgery, a head or chest injury, or even a sudden girl spurt, and certain viral illnesses. Dysautonomia usually strikes girls going into their adolescent stage, and females outnumber males five to one. Because it's the cause of Justin's dysautonomia, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, otherwise known as EDS. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome causes the body to produce faulty collagen. This makes a person's joints extremely easy to dislocate, sometimes even by doing something as simple as rolling over in bed. There are more than four different types of EDS, most of which have a normal lifespan, but with vascular EDS, the kind that Destiny has, it's <coughs> different. Vascular EDS causes not only the joints to be affected, but the organs and blood vessels as well. <coughs> this means that there are additional risks with not only any type of surgery, but even with daily life. A person with vascular EDS can have so many complications that their lifespan is usually only about 20 years of age. I want to be sure to point out that Destiny turned 20 in April of this year. This is some of the bracing that Destiny has to wear due to her joints dislocating and her bones breaking so often. 
In these pictures show some of the problems she has had with her pick line and having IVs put in. She no longer has a pick line because it was forming clots and began to bleed a lot, which made it too dangerous to use. But because her EDS causes her veins to roll, flow, and IVs to infiltrate, it's very hard for her to receive fluids and certain medications now. Here EDS is given Destiny a broken finger just from smoothing out her comforter after she made her bed. You can also see how badly jointed her hand is. While many people who are double jointed can make their hands do this whenever they please, Destiny does not always have a choice in the matter. And it's very painful when you can't put the joints in your hand back together as easily as they come apart. One of the most common forms of dysautonomia is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, otherwise known as POTS. While dysautonomia is a set of symptoms that can have many causes, POTS is instead a set of symptoms that most of the people suffering from dysautonomia have. Many doctors dealing with dysautonomia even consider the symptoms of POTS as their red flag. POTS is described as the body's inability to adjust to a person standing in an upright position. When a healthy person stands, their blood vessels constrict, and their heart rate and blood pressure both increase slightly. When a person with POTS stands, the blood vessels don't constrict, and this lowers their blood pressure. At the same time, their heart rate increases dramatically, and this causes that person to faint or experience extreme dizziness. The symptoms of POTS were Destiny's first clue to having dysautonomia. Most people with dysautonomia usually only have minor complications, such as not being able to stand for long periods of time, sometimes not being able to drive due to fainting. One of the hardest aspects to deal with is the fact that dysautonomia is an invisible illness, which means that the people suffering from it usually appear healthy. It causes many friends, family members, and even doctors to let them believe that it's all in their head. It's because of this that many of the people suffering from dysautonomia end up with emotional problems, oftentimes including depression. But when dysautonomia is paired with certain other diseases, it can cause major problems, it can even shorten the person's lifespan by many years. For example, the type of EDS that affects the organs as well as the joints makes the entire body so fragile that the average lifespan is only 20 years. One of the biggest things to know about dysautonomia is that right now, there is no cure. There's only symptom management. There are, however, some very effective treatments and medicines available, some of which are listed on this slide. Midadrine is a medicine which increases blood pressure by constricting blood vessels. Saline therapy fools the body into thinking it has more blood than it really does. Plasmapheresis is a treatment which removes antibodies from the bloodstream, and it prevents them from attacking their own immune system. <coughs> IVIG is very similar to plasmapheresis, but it targets a different antibody. This basically gives an immune system to someone who doesn't have one. And then beta blockers are used to help control their heart rates. This slide shows Destiny's medications. On the top, you can see the pills she takes during the night laid out on the table. And on the bottom left, you can see how much medicine she has for one month, and they're still short of A. On the other side, you can see a handful of pills is Destiny holding the amount of pills she takes in just one day. Starting a project, raising money, and trying to make this something people heard about were my only goals in the beginning. It wasn't until I started to spend a lot of time with Destiny that I understood how horrible this disease can be and how truly painful it is to have a team of doctors who have no idea where to even begin. The closer I became with Destiny and the more I saw, the more I knew I could never give up. I began to make this presentation, and I am now talking with people who can help me take this project to the next level. Right now, all of the money Project Destiny raises goes directly to Destiny. We sell handmade fleece blankets, pins, and awareness bracelets and keychains to make our money, as well as accept donations at Rotary conferences and other small functions. Destiny's family is unable to support her financially, and this money helps her stay connected with the world. It helps pay for her co-payments for her medicines, joint braces, books, and just helps make her life a little bit easier. These are pictures from our Grand Rapids Youth Exchange Conference last summer. We were able to raise $1,000 for Destiny in just a few hours. And this is the picture taken of the group participating in the Dysautonomia Awareness Walk. This was done in June of last year, and it was comforting to see and talk with people from around the area who are also suffering from dysautonomia. This is Destiny and Robin at the walk, a Rotarian who does a lot with youth exchange. Destiny and her best friend Lauren, Destiny and I, and the group who went to the walk with Destiny. And Claire's also in this picture with us. 
By becoming involved with this, I've seen how much of an effect Destiny really has on the people she meets. I've discovered a whole new side to me, as well as to many other people. Some of the people she has touched are the people who take care of her. On the top, she has pictured with Sandy Teston, an incredible person who I truly believe is the reason Destiny is alive and where she is today. And on the bottom with her auntie, another amazing woman who takes care of Destiny out in Boston. Destiny has also had a huge impact on her friends. Here she's pictured with a friend from college, and again with her best friend, Lauren. One of the many ways Destiny has changed my life is by allowing me to make this presentation. By doing this, I can better understand what she was going through, and I sometimes even know what she means when she tells me about her doctor's appointments. I know so much about dysautonomia now, and I know so much more about medical anything than I ever would have wanted to know. And these are my sources for the presentation. Now I'm going to read you a speech I gave as my final in my communications class. Our topic was about something that completely changed our lives. I knew right away what I was going to talk about, and I think it's appropriate to end the presentation with today. That is the sound of a person's heart barely beating. That is the sound which comes from the monitor of one of my best friends. It was this sound that I clung to during my days in Boston, because no matter how slow, weak, or inconsistent it was, that was the sound of life. A sound which I quickly came to learn can end at any moment. It was the end of the summer. My first summer before I started college, I had become extremely close to a fellow exchange student, Destiny, who was terminally ill. Little did I know how close we would really become when she invited me to go to Boston to take care of her while our aunt took a vacation. I cannot explain the emotions I felt as I prepared for this trip. I knew the possibility was very high that we could end up in the hospital, and I also knew it was very possible that she could die while I was there. Still, being able to see her again was completely worth the possibilities I had prepared myself for. My first few days in Boston were fantastic. Destiny was walking, and we even went whale watching. I was so happy to be with her again that I never realized the consequence of us busying ourselves for the first few days. A crash. Crashing is normal for Destiny. It usually happens after she has a good day or two and she just to enjoy them instead of staying in bed. What made this crash different from the rest was how sick she had actually become. It was Friday. My day started around five in the morning when the doctors came in for their rounds. We had been in the hospital for two days now, still with no results. Original blood tests showed an infection of the heart, extremely serious for someone without a weakened immune system. Now they weren't sure. I was so confused. I had always thought of doctors as having all the right answers, and I found out quickly that that's not always the case. By the end of the day, we were both exhausted, and it was clear that the new medicine they were trying wasn't having any effect. I continued reading my book while Destiny Skyped with another friend. Suddenly, she stopped laughing and grabbed her chest. She calmly told her friend she would call back in a few minutes, hung up, and told me to run and get the doctor. It took about 10 minutes for the room to be fully staffed and getting into action. I couldn't tell you exactly how many syringes of morphine she was given, or how many doctors asked me what happened. What I can tell you is that every single muscle in my body froze when I was told to call and tell her aunt and previous caretaker that this was it, that she was going to die. I had been completely calm until this point and continued to be calm while I told her aunt that I didn't know exactly what was happening, but they were pretty sure it was a heart attack. While I was on the phone with her previous caretaker from Wisconsin, I saw a nurse run into the room and scream down the hall for the doctors to come. I threw down my phone and ran into the room, and I felt as if I had walked into an exorcism. Although they didn't know this for sure until the next day, the new medicine caused an extremely rare type of muscle cramping. My best explanation is to say that every single joint in her body had dislocated while her muscles simultaneously contracted. No one knew what to do. I stood by Destiny's bed and held her hand for nearly three hours while drug after drug was pumped into her body. There was so much adrenaline moving through me I felt sick, but I knew I had to be there for her. I also knew if I started to show the emotions I was feeling inside that the doctors would have me leave. It took strength I didn't know I had, but I kept it together. The pain was relentless, and I couldn't have felt more helpless. 
There was actually a point when her pain became so bad that I even wished she would die. Finally, around 2.30 in the morning, Destiny's muscles began to relax. I couldn't believe it, and neither could the doctors. I talked with her about what had happened, and then sat by her bedside and held her hand while she tried to sleep. The next two nights were emotionally taxing and filled with seizures, but held nothing as serious as the first. Yet, I became so constantly full of adrenaline that I did not sleep more than seven hours from the time I woke Friday morning till I was home at midnight on Monday, totaling more than 90 hours, and I was so afraid to leave the room that I chose not to eat. The beeping of the heart monitor, <coughs> the code lights flashing by the door, and even the sound of nurses yelling all became engraved in my mind as part of my routine while I was in Boston, and it completely changed my life. This week was easily the hardest experience I have had in my life but it is something I would do again in a second, by being not only someone's friend, but their advocate, and learn that each day is precious and definitely not a promise. I realize how much strength I have, both physically and emotionally, and learn that shaking is not always a sign of weakness, but can instead show that you have the power to control your emotions when necessary. And probably the most important things I learned, that the smallest things in life can often be the most cherished, and that those small, pointless things that used to let irritate me just the beeping of that heart monitor, really don't matter. To sit and hold Destiny's hand while she thanked me for staying with her will forever be one of my most treasured memories. And it did not take long for me to realize that it was no longer the beeping that bothered me, but the silence that came so often in between. Thank you.